have to go down. Hello? Hi. Hello, everybody in the back. We are going to be starting this panel um, just in about a minute. So if you can make your way up, um, you can sit anywhere around here. And in case you didn't know, uh, if you don't want your photo taken, you should get a red uh, lanyard at the registration desk. Otherwise, we do have our lovely photographer, Michael, right here. And he might be walking around taking your photo. Uh, this event is also being streamed online. Um, and it will be recorded later. So if you don't want to be recorded, maybe you do not stand near these wonderful panelists. We also have this great Twitter hashtag. If you're following or tweeting about the event online, you can use found privacy. Was privacy lost? Did we find it? We'll soon find out. So thank you for coming, and we'll start this in about just a minute. Great, so I guess I'll start off introducing myself and the Internet Law and Policy Foundry. My name is Tiffany Lee, and I am a fellow with the Foundry. I'm also a privacy fellow at the Wikimedia Foundation. So this event is co-hosted by both Wikimedia and the Internet Law and Policy Foundry. The Foundry is a fairly new organization. Uh, we are a sort of a trade association, a nonprofit for early stage professionals in technology, law, and policy. So it's a foundation that was based out of D.C., but now has expanded to the West Coast. So thank you, everyone, for joining us at our first West Coast event. And without further ado, let's start off with today's panel, which will discuss privacy, innovations, and regulations. So I guess I'd like to start off by asking everyone to just briefly introduce yourself. Um, where do you work and what do you do, especially involving privacy? Thank you, Tiffany. My name is Elena Alkina. I am currently at the Global Privacy Office at McKesson. It's a, a very big uh, healthcare technology company. And uh, I work on very 
face privacy, privacy issues, uh, starting from legal controls and compliance controls, policies, training, um, data agreements, but also work on verification of health data and other data that can be used for secondary purposes. I um, used to be a lawyer. I uh, began my legal career in 95, and I practiced law for about seven years, and later on I realized that I'm more drawn to business uh, decisions and strategy versus uh, practicing law. So I like to create, I like to build, and I like to work with businesses to find a way how they can accomplish what, what's needed. So I moved to the compliance function, and right now I'm more like on the business side wearing a privacy hat. I, and outside of my daily job, I uh, am committed to advancing women. I am a co-founder for Women in Securing Privacy Group in the Bay Area. If you're interested in joining or learning more about it, please um, ask me later after the panel. And I'm also uh, part of the organizations for leading women in technology. That's another great organization that helps women in various technology fields to advance their career to the next level. Now that I got that figured out. Um, hi, I'm Gautam Hans. I'm policy counsel at the Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, CDT is a nonprofit research and advocacy organization based in DC, and I am based here on the West Coast working on a range of issues in tech policy, uh, most notably privacy, security, and free speech. Uh, before I was here for CDT, I was based on uh, in CDT's office in DC, the headquarters, as the Cluster Fellow focused on privacy and data issues. Um, so I've been working on privacy for a while um, during law school and then afterwards uh, and have spent a lot of time thinking about both government regulation and enforcement as well as the intersection of privacy and speech and privacy and uh, surveillance and issues surrounding government access in all sorts of different venues. Um, Hello, uh, Jake Snow. I am a staff attorney at the San Francisco office of the Federal Trade Commission. Um, I've been at the FTC for about three years, and I do primarily uh, consumer protection work, um, including uh, data security and privacy. Um, and uh, before I joined the FTC uh, about three years ago, I was an IP uh, litigator. Um, so, uh, so everyone knows, uh, my remarks today um, don't speak for the commission. I don't speak for any individual commissioner, just in case that wasn't obvious. Facing the same challenges with the microphone. Hi, I'm Michelle Paulson. I'm a legal director at the Wikimedia Foundation, the nonprofit that is hosting you today, and also hosts uh, Wikipedia, as well as a number of other online collaborative educational projects. Um, I've been with the foundation for a little over seven years, and in that time, um, worked on a variety of things, and now mostly focus on litigation, dealing with freedom of speech issues and IP, um, and a lot of our privacy portfolio, which entails uh, figuring out the internal and external policies and procedures uh, that we use to safeguard the data of our staff, partners, and uh, our community of editors worldwide. Hi, I'm Shal Lumera. Uh, I'm a partner at Gibson Dunn. I co-chair our technology transactions group. And uh, in addition to being a lawyer, I, uh, I'm actually a transactional lawyer, um, which is perhaps uh, a, a, a little uncommon for people who focus on data privacy. Uh, I come at data privacy primarily from the perspective of the, someone who does deals, um, and, and in particular deals for which include um, licensing, acquisition, disposition of regulated data as an asset to us. Great, well thank you everyone. So as you see, we have a large uh, variety of different experiences here. We have people in nonprofits, people in law firms, people in government. We have legal side, the policy side. Um, we'll have a chance for you to all to ask questions later. But first I'd like to start off just very, just very briefly I guess what are maybe, what would be the top issue you would think today in privacy in 2016? Let's just go around the table and then afterwards we'll discuss some of those issues more in depth. Sure, Shali, what, how about you starting? Can I ask, before we begin, is it, uh, can we 
Can you raise your hand? It's just very nice to know who's in the audience. Uh, can you raise your hand if you're an attorney or lawyer? Oh, a lot. Um, <laughs> if you come from the software development side or IT. Okay, any students? Privacy? Security workers? No. Oh. <laughs> Security? Okay, great, thank you. Sorry, it's always good to know who's in the audience. That's great. Um, for those of you following at home, basically we have a lot of people doing all of those things. <laughs> so how about Shalu? What's the number one issue you would think um, in today's privacy space? Uh, that's a really hard question to start with, uh, just because uh, to, to single out just one, um, there are a number of pretty important cases pending. I mean, so if I think of one, it would be uh, Spokio, which is before the Supreme Court right now, right? So uh, we have this proliferation of statutes and uh, which, which prescribe statutory damages uh, for you know, various sorts of data privacy, data security uh, breaches. Um, and the question at issue there is whether those are enforceable without proof or evidence that there has actually been tangible damage to uh, the individuals in, uh, affected um, to, 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 the, to, to the litigants. Um, you know, that could have a very pronounced effect. You know, the, the way that comes down will have a pronounced effect on the, the scope of liability uh, under those statutes. And it's taught, it, it, you know, it, where we go with that is kind of indeterminate right now, particularly based on what's happened with the Supreme Court and you know, the way the votes are balancing out right now. Um, I also believe it's kind of hard to pick one, uh, but I think at least one that holds my interest for me is um, just generally how organizations are going to be approaching collection of data through wearables, facial uh, recognition, biometric data, um, and what kind of regulatory sc scheme, if any, is going to come into place to safeguard that information um, from misuse from outside parties. Yeah, it's a general question. I'll, I'll, I'll give a general answer. Um, I, I think kind of the, the increase in um, the ability for uh, companies and governments to collect, store, and analyze uh, uh, data. And I think that's sort of the combination of what people call the Internet of Things and big data. Um, when it comes to uh, the Internet of Things, um, there's, there's, uh, the FTC has a real serious focus in that area. Um, it was last week, a uh, case, uh, consent order against uh, ASIS came out. Um, relating to some vulnerabilities that in their routers. So if anybody has an ASUS router, uh, go ahead and install the update. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, that case uh, had to do with, with routers and vulnerabilities in the routers and vulnerabilities in the uh, software uh, that was installed in routers and the software that people could use to configure them. And um, that's something where you have a situation where people are using a device. Um, they're relying on security representations that have been made to them in the sales process, and they're just, uh, I think, reasonably expecting that a device they buy on the market is going to protect their, uh, their privacy and their security. Um, and in fact, sometimes um, those expectations are frustrated. Um, and so um, that's something that I think um, is going to see more of. There are a variety of ways in which consumer products, starting with routers maybe, but moving on to biometric uh, devices and the Internet of Things, where uh, security problems and, and vulnerabilities can be discovered, um, and I think it's a lesson to industry uh, that that those things need to be taken care of at the design phase rather than after release. I definitely second the spoke you mentioned, um, not because I worked on an amicus in this case, although I do, you know, I. I will preface this by saying that my predictive powers are basically zero, but I'm predicting a 4-4 split on this one, the passage of Justice Scalia, who I think would have been probably on Spokio's side. The other issue that I'm thinking a lot about now is data breach. Um, we have seen many, many security incidents over the last couple of years with very, very little action from Congress. So I don't think the effect of this is really regulatory or legislative. I do think it's on the PR side. Um, consumers, I think, are certainly more aware of 
data breach and not just because of the incessant notification notices we all get through email posts, but the ability of a company to protect your data and when the data that the company collects is increasingly more sensitive, as in the Internet of Things, wearables um, through devices, I think companies may not need to necessarily worry about the more legislative or regulatory oversight, but in the court of public opinion, I think data breach is going to be much more serious in the coming years than it was in the past. It's a hard question. There is so much going on in the world lately, the advancement of technologies we use, and uh, last couple of weeks were particularly interesting. And uh, I think what's on my mind lately is the new data transfer mechanism between to transfer data between EU and US. And as you know, the safe harbor uh, was invalidated in October uh, last year, and the new uh, data transfer agreement uh, was reached in February last month between uh, EU and US. And uh, that's quite interesting. So the, this year will be um, a year to reflect and re-architect the global privacy approach uh, for all of us, not only co companies, but also in individuals. And uh, relevant to the EU-US relationship with data transfer, the uh, GDPR, the, the new law that um, will be effective sometime in 2018 if everything goes well. You know how it happens. They promise that um, after Article 29 and Article 31 and all the states and European Union review everything which they promise is going to be done by July or uh, August this year, um, we'll see. So it's going to affect uh, companies and the new GDPR. The new law is much more restrictive than privacy shield and impose very burdensome and uh, strict requirements on companies. And I think uh, as well as uh, providing additional protection to citizens, non-US citizens, which is great. Uh, but I think how it can affect us here and uh, other countries that don't have adequate legal systems to transfer data uh, from EU. Um, it's uh, that the GDPR is going to affect not only data controllers, um, not only companies who have businesses in EU um, and US, for example, it's going to affect companies that are more processors and they might just target, they don't have presence in EU, but they may just target EU, uh, EU, EU citizens or may frame, uh, I think that's the word they use in the regulations, like framing or monitoring EU citizens. So. Which uh, is going to have a significant impact on U.S. economy and U.S. businesses, especially startups. Great, thank you. That's a wide breadth of issues. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think about it, there are a lot of issues in privacy today, right? Um, let's see. We have consumer privacy. We had Spokio. We had um, the new ASIS order. And I think the EU regulation. If for those of you who don't know, um, the EU has a large privacy regulation was formerly a directive and will now become a new regulation, as Elena mentioned, in 2018. Some of the issues there are how this will affect American companies. And I think that's something we can start off with. It's a consumer-facing issue, um, but it is international in scope. So actually, Shalu, I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit. How do you think that this regulation will affect um, companies like your clients or any other tech companies in this space? Um. Potentially creates just huge exposure, right? So the the statute has extraterritorial reach. It uh, it covers uh, uh, it governs um, exchange of data, use of data, personal information, personal data of EU subjects wherever it happens in the world, and the penalties are up to four percent of global annual turnover, which is a fairly sizable sum, um, and would affect my clients. Um, uh, and and ways in which it could affect them. I mean, so for instance, there's there's uh, there's uh, the erasure law. So uh, it, there was a proposal of a right to be forgotten. Um, the, the case came out in Europe about that about two three years ago, and that's sort of been baked into the data regulation. Uh, and there's an sort of, you know, for the litigators out there, there's an obvious conflicts of law issue, right? Which is it's going to com conflict with Rule 34 and, uh, you know, holds and discovery requests. So uh, 
th th that's something that uh, companies are going to have to wrestle with. Um, uh, I, I think the conflict of laws in the extraterritorial territorial reach and just the size of the penalties, those are some big issues that we'll have to deal with. It also it will, um, uh, it, it also may ease certain uh, issues that uh, U.S. enterprises are dealing with now insofar as there will be one uniform set of regula it, it, This is a regulation as opposed to a directive, as, as you mentioned earlier, right? So the, uh, the member states are not at liberty to sort of interpret the, regul the regulation and have conflicting implementations of them. This will be one set of regulations that will govern across the board. So there'll be uh, there'll, there'll be uh, a measure of clarity there. And then there are some provisions that are just kind of interesting that uh, companies are going to need to learn how to deal with, for instance, the, uh, the data portability uh, provisions. So, you know, in data deals uh, amongst enterprises, we've long required that uh, that data at, at the end, at the end of engagement, for instance, at the end of an IT services engagement, that the data be ported over to, for instance, a, a company's new vendor, and with the schema required in order to interpret that data. Um, and, and what the, the data uh, regulation does is to actually give that right to consumers, um, both uh, to, to to be able to port their data from one company to another, and then to actually provide the means by which that can be done. Great, thank you. Um, and feel free, any of you, to jump in if you have specific opinions. I was just thinking, if we're talking about, you know, the EU data regulation and consumer privacy, um, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is the EU-US privacy shield. Um, and I was wondering if Jake might have any opinions on this. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I can comment. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, well, how about Got him? Anything? Any opinion whatsoever? <laughs> I'm happy to uh, speak a little bit, although this is far from my area of expertise, um, only because uh, my boss and Julie Brill did a podcast about this, so I know what at least our perspective is, which is that this is a step in the right direction, although I think the surveillance concerns that uh, the court raised when invalidating Safe Harbor are you know, obviously still concerns. Um, I, I think having not read the document, um, I think the devil will be in the details. Uh, this is a very liquid answer, right? I don't know yet, we'll have to see details, so we'll have to figure it out. But I mean, that's sort of the situation. I, I think this, the decision was certainly, I don't think anyone could have predicted the decision in the Sherman's case um, long in advance, and so it really destabilized a lot of the conventional wisdom. Um, and so to the degree to which the privacy shield can uh, return us to a state of regulatory stability, I, th I think we'll have to see how that's implemented and what the document says. I, I think some of the fundamental political questions underlying the court's decision have yet to be addressed. And so I think relying upon the privacy shield as the um, deus ex machina is probably not warranted, and I suspect that most of the entities covered by the transfer of data between the U.S. and the EU are not expecting it to be the savior of this particular issue. So, uh, interesting times, I guess, is probably the verdict. <laughs> One thing from just a practical business perspective, um, the privacy shield is pretty extensive in the obligations that it puts on companies that are planning on transferring data and what that does to smaller to mid-sized organizations is put a pretty um, substantial monetary cost on the ability to comply with this, either that or effectively shut them out of certain markets unless they're able to comply with one of the other proof mechanisms. Um, so I think that there will be some long-term impact on uh, the ability for smaller companies to be able to flourish internationally. The only thing I'd add to it, and you know, it, the, the text just came out a couple days ago, so I'm still reading it, um, but it's a couple aspects of it sort of leap out immediately. Um, one is that uh, it provides that the EU subjects uh, should uh, have 
uh, as a dispute resolution mechanism available with the entities, with the U.S. entities to, uh, under the privacy shield uh, in order to resolve disputes regarding use of their data or alleged breaches of their data. And it should be done in a way that is um, th th that it, it doesn't demand expense by the um, uh, by, by that to you, uh, data subject. One of the interesting things about that, and I, I imagine um, this uh, this may have been uh, a, par a part of the motivation on the U.S. Uh, uh, negotiators is that kind of dovetails with what's become standard pr practice and privacy policies over the last few years since like uh, the at and and the Concepcion cases, which is to include uh, an arbitration mechanism within a privacy policy in the terms of use um, that, you know, under which there's a class action waiver, but under which uh, the company, uh, you know, the, the, the enterprise assumes the cost of the arbitration. And so, you know, what, what it, it actually, a measure that's intended to protect the uh, EU subject there uh, actually also dovetails with a uh, liability uh, mitigation mechanism that we've been building into terms of use for a few years now. So one of the important components um, during the negotiation and privacy shield was negotiated between the EU and US was the right of private action uh, for non-US, uh, non-EU, non-US citizens and uh, as you know, Obama recently signed the uh, new law that will give a um, right to, um, to private action for non-U.S. citizens. And what's interesting about it that um, when U.S. citizens have certain rights to sue U.S. government um, and enforcement authorities, the non-U.S. citizens will have uh, slightly uh, narrow rights to, to sue um, um, U.S. authorities and enforcement authorities and government authorities. Also, um, there's going to be a list of those authorities. So not every government and enforcement authorities can be sued by non-U.S. citizen, and which, which is quite interesting. And that list will be nominated, I think, by the Attorney General. So um, it, it's kind of like I don't. I'm very concerned about the new uh, new law and how it can address what was concern coming from European Union that uh, non-U.S. citizens don't have the same right and we don't have a way to address. So it's quite interesting. I'll see how it's going to go. Great, thank you. I think that's something we're all watching right now. And I think we're seeing right now that privacy is becoming more of a global issue and not just a country by country issue. Um, and we see a lot of changes, as you all were mentioning, just based on the fact that companies take in so much more personal data now. So I was wondering if we could talk a little bit more about that, about how this increase in personal data, whether it be health data, you know, data from your fitness tracker, student data, um, or just information you put into Facebook, how was this increase in big data changing privacy for consumers? If anyone wants to start. Um, so oh, I think one of the interesting developments uh, in, in, in the past year, uh, that's sort of driven by uh, the collection of data by enterprises is reflected in the fact that you'll, you'll notice that a lot of big tech companies have started to open source or distribute their machine learning and big data technology and a lot of the big data you know, technology that, um, that the industry relies upon are, are open source. And, uh, you know, we can surmise the motivations behind that. It's to, the the real value is in the data itself and in the data repositories and what's in it. You know, it's it's mutually beneficial then to allow this code to go out and to to, to be to be developed on at large because, uh, you know, the, 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 when the technology is developed, some of the 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 companies that will be able to probably the most benefit from it are those that are collecting large data repositories just as part of part of their business um, and you know we're I'm actually seeing some of this in academia that you know some of the most interesting research that is in in, in data science right now is not being done uh, in the academy actually it's it, you know the, the researchers want to go to the big enterprises because they're the ones who actually have the most interesting data collections um, yeah I speak another comment on that I think it's a it's a really important point um, uh, because a lot of the machine learning and uh, data analysis packages are open source these days, it really reduces the barriers to entry for using those kinds of uh, tools 
to analyze um, large sets of data, but also not so large sets of data. Um, and also, it's very easy um, for uh, companies to generate large sets of data. You, you, know, you don't have to be a Google to have a large amount of data about your customers. <clears throat> um, I mean, you could, you could imagine that if, if you, you, know, you run a food truck and you think, um, huh, I wonder if I should ask my developer friend to try to de-anonymize uh, the identity of my customers who send in orders through an app and identify them on social media so that you can follow up with them, you can make additional contacts and things like that. Um, um, I don't know this for sure, but I think 10 years ago, you might not, that might not be doable in a weekly project. I think today, uh, it might be. And that's something that makes it uh, much easier for, uh, for uh, startups, but also individuals, uh, to do this kind of analysis. Um, and I think it's entirely possible that they won't be thinking through security privacy implications of doing that analysis um, because it's so easy for them because of the packages. I believe that technology will change healthcare. Uh, there are so many interesting things going on in healthcare. I'll give you a couple examples. For example, I don't know if you heard about the digital pill. So there is a pill. I'll give you an example. Let's say I have my grandma in New York and I live here and um, she thinks she's okay to do whatever she wants to do, but I can't really control how much she drinks, how much water she drinks, if she eats regularly, if she sleeps, who knows, things can happen. So the digital pill, if she takes a digital pill, it allows me, of course, after I set up all the controls and appropriate um, to, to me and my grandma, um, I will be able to monitor how many hours she slept, how many liters of water she drank and how much food she took. And I can do much more like how many hours of physical activities did she move at all. So basically whatever my fitness device does, the pill can do it for my grandma. But that's the benefits, but think about it. It's, it's scary. First of all, um, if that pill goes into the wrong hand, um, that anything can happen. Also think about hackers. Um, so if hackers can do something, well, it depends what the pill includes inside, and there are things change already. So if there are some technologies that hackers can utilize to hack the, the, the pill, so it can, uh, can, can end up being very bad. Um, so this, these are the implications, what technology can do to save human race, and at the same time can, can, can do quite opposite. Um, the same as, uh, I think right now, what cardiologists can do for your peacemaker device, right? It's, I think there were some situations where uh, hackers were able to hack the device just for fun of it. And uh, um, so it was pretty scary because uh, it really affected the, uh, the person who was wearing the device. And uh, um, it's interesting how we can mitigate the risk and benefits that technology can provide to us. Um, I think the big data era has led to a uh, shoot first and ask questions later mentality to collection, and to some degree the ship has sailed, and collection is, pervasive collection of data is the default um, for many companies and startups and those who are interfacing with consumers. I think the issues around security are a good reason to think about data collection in a limited way, but I also think that the way those systems for collection are set up is also something that deserves a lot of attention. Uh, more knowledge, does it, more information doesn't equal more knowledge necessarily, and I think the predicates and the uh, presumptions that companies have when collecting data and analyzing it can be often hidden to both, to, to everyone, to the internal staff and to the public as well. That's, I don't think that's nefarious. I think that's just we don't necessarily know, know our own biases. So when thinking about big data analytics as a tool for social good and for um, you know better understanding of individuals and, and potentially even society, I think that's all uh, very possible, and I hope it comes to pass. But I also wonder as to how that collection and those decisions are architected and whether or not they can reify social difference and how we can work to inc be inclusive and uh, protective of uh, everyone so that it doesn't just end up reinforcing certain issues that we've seen across the board. So 
kind of um, what Jake was mentioning about how consumers generally expect if something is on the market, it's going to be safe. Um, I think that in combination with, frankly, the shininess of all of the new technology that's out there, I'm so excited I could wear a Fitbit and know exactly how much I need to go to the gym. Um, I can tell that my dog got his food this morning um, through an app. It's, it's great, and we don't stop to think about what... Um, what, where this information is going, who has control over it, who it's being shared with. And I think because of that, it has fundamentally shifted what was considered a reasonable expectation of privacy before. And that has legal implications um, because it's such a subjective standard. Um, things that are tied to what we should be expecting as our privacy will start shifting in the law as well and we'll have fewer protections and there will be fewer reasons for for companies to go out of their way to ensure that you have control over your data or your data is insecure um, and other things that I think many other uh, countries, particularly Europe, are now thinking about um, how to take that under control. One other point on that, I think um, <clears throat> that uh, the question of whether to uh, retain or to get rid of large amounts of data that are collected through whatever whatever product um, is is one that that I think uh, currently uh, the the balance is heavily on the collect and and, and keep around side. Um, figure out what to do with it later. Figure out what kind of wisdom can be drawn from um, that data uh, later on. But um, I think that uh, startups and corporations and larger uh, businesses who are thinking about being, being uh, uh, sort of best, uh, doing uh, adopting best practices and being um, uh, sort of ideal citizens uh, of security and privacy. Will take a hard look at the data they're collecting and they'll think about what they need to serve their customers, uh, and they will think about uh, having uh, policies that, that that destroy data that's not not necessary. Uh, and uh, that's something that the FTC has made a lot of uh, recommendations. Uh, uh, relating to in the in a uh, data security uh, privacy advice and in the recently released uh, report uh, on big data, and so um, you know it's, it's worth being an advocate to uh, maybe for for uh, your your employers, um, but also to others to think about uh, not keeping uh, some of this data. That's also something that enterprises are starting are going to have to deal with just from a statutory and regulatory perspective as well. There seems there's a there's a move towards. Uh, uh, codifying requirements to have to require data to be deleted uh, once it's no longer useful for the purpose for which it was originally collected. And it's, it's the state of California is now baking that into the educational code. For instance, it's baked into the into the data regulation. And uh, interpreting that and dealing with that is going to be an issue that enterprises are going to have to deal with in the next few years. So, does anyone on this panel think we should actually be collecting more data? No, the answer is no. Okay. So everybody out there, companies, just stop collecting data. I'm going to abstain from that. <laughs> stop. I, I don't think it's possible. I mean, it's to, 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 I, it, it, I mean, I don't think it's arithmetically possible. Right? I mean, there's Moore's Law, and, and the storage actually grows faster than Moore's Law. I think right now... The estimates here vary pretty widely, but I think the world has right now something like 10 to the 21 or 10 to the 22 bytes of data, which, you know, is like... It's all relevant. It's all relevant why we're doing this, why we're collecting data, for what purpose. I think purpose is the driver in the business decision and collection of data. If, if we need this data, then why not? But, of course, we need to disclose it and be transparent with our practices. But I think the main reason, main question for me is why we're doing what we're doing. If we come up with the right answer or the answer i think there might be some situations where why not but uh, again there should be a reason a good reason why you want to collect more because right now most companies they just collect so much and they don't know what to do with that um, so but, but it's a change that to the products themselves right so like we just don't know right it's just in case that's the whole thing and it's every it's car right is becoming uh, connected now and the amount of data that's generated by a car is phenomenal if you think about it and so tell i mean telematics has been 
touted for a while as being the next big space, but it's just for obvious reasons. I mean, it, with uh, I, mean, I think that's the first place, one of the first places we're going to see the effect of the Internet of Things. Or, you know, how many of us are willing to part with our cell phone or our Fitbit or, you know, because we don't want additional data collected, right? I mean, as nervous as we may be about, or as nervous as one might this really be about the idea of being tracked and data being collected, um, you know, the market shows that we're not, well, that, that we're still ready to buy the products that are collecting more and more information about us. This is sort of the reason that the data breach and security point uh, was the one that I raised earlier, which is that, you know, it may not be for, if, their business, if there's a business purpose to collect a lot of data, and I think there certainly is one, or at least there's a perceived purpose, the only way to limit that is to, probably, at least at this point, is to, um, realize that there's a related business purpose to limit your data collection, which is where the data breach and security issues come in. Because the more you have, the more tempting out of a target you are. And I think being um, uh, a little thoughtful in advance about why and what kinds of data you're collecting, as opposed to a sort of like, you know, grab it all now and figure it out later mentality, means that not only, but you probably have a more manageable data set to figure out what to do with just having an infinite amount information or a seemingly infinite amount of information, but also for those people who, or those actors who are external who want access to your data for whatever reason, uh, the less you have, probably the less tempting target you might be. That, I don't think that's true across the board. I think, you know, obviously some data sets will be more valuable than others. Some companies will be more attractive than others to, you know, for unauthorized access. But I think as a general principle, you know, I think that limiting idea of data breaches being a, a business liability is, is can be very motivating for a lot of uh, a lot of firms. Kind of related to that, um, not all big data is equal. You, it's not just what you're collecting or how much of it. Um, it's also how long are you keeping it? Um, is it encrypted? How is it being stored? And is it uh, being protected in transit? Who are you sharing it with? Um, these, what, how the answers to these questions really changes how um, big of a vulnerability you've left yourself um, and your consumers. So it's very scary out there, um, essentially. But there are ways that companies um, can protect their, com their consumers and their users. So what about outside of the corporate realm? What can consumers or just individuals do about this? Should they be checking their privacy settings? Should they be going further and talking to companies, to the representatives? What do you see as a way forward for protecting privacy? And how can individuals help that? Well, uh, in the privacy area, I'd say that um, the FTC's main enforcement focus um, has been uh, encouraging companies to be transparent and upfront uh, with consumers uh, regarding their privacy practices um, and also <clears throat> and also uh, in ensuring that when um, uh, when the industry makes representations to consumers that they keep those promises um, and uh, I, I think that's a, a, a probably a pretty good place to start uh, the uh, I think everyone has different preferences when it comes to privacy some people share everything uh, they think uh, some people have a you know air gapped Linux box in their closet. Um, those two people have different preferences with respect to what they will tolerate when it comes to the privacy of the products they use. Uh, and uh, the the purpose of of, of the, the FTC's enforcement actions in this area in that area is is notice and choice for people to understand what they're getting to make educated choices. Um, and I think you'll also and so I think as consumers, uh, uh, folks can. Um, you know, like look closely at what uh, the, the, uh, the companies that are offering products uh, tell you about protecting your privacy, um, and then hold them to it. But if they don't hold, and if they don't uh, abide by those promises, then you, know, you can go to consumer.ftc.gov and you can submit a uh, complaint. <laughs> um, and so I, I think uh, you know, educating yourself about uh, privacy and enforcing uh, companies to to abide by the promises they make is is a good start. Probably not news to folks in this room. Yeah, so I think, that, yeah, kind of going off of what Jake said, is it's really educating yourself and 
while I'm sure all of you don't want to read every page of a privacy policy, um, it's, I think having a general idea of what the practices are of the companies that you share, the data that you personally care about the most um, is a good first step. Um, if you can't do that, I think just think about ways that you can protect yourself. Use two-factor fact, two auth. Um, see if you can get your devices encrypted. Um, you know, don't use passwords. Like, there's a number of steps that you can take that are short of reading every edition of Apple's privacy policy. I feel like we, we tend to complain and blame the big brother who's watching us and big companies, and I'm, I'm guilty of that. But sometimes I think we forget that with um, our basic cell phones and video and photo capacities, we are on threats. We, it's not the big brother who is spying on us. Uh, I mean, they do too, but um, it's us. We, we take pictures of people who might not want to be uh, in the photo. We videotape and then we put it on social media for everyone. We forgot about basic code of conduct in the society where we should respect each other's rights and maybe think about it from, not from the legal perspective, but how do I want to be treated? Or maybe some people are more open and more um, have appetite. Their appetite for risk is different from, for example, from, from me. But think about the cultural differences and how other countries think about privacy and try to think about it and respect their um, their, their rights and their, uh, their preferences. And I just want to say, maybe it's just me because I grew up in Soviet Union and the big brother was watching me. Um, and in addition to the Soviet times, um, I used to live in a secret city. It wasn't even on the map. Um, my parents, as uh, computer engineers, software engineers, they were designing nuclear bombs. So there was a specific city in Moscow, in Russia. Um, no one knew about it, even the Russian population. So we were monitored, like our phones, everything. I mean, the, the city was like, had everything. You didn't need to leave, and it's not like you could leave easily, and no one could come and visit. So growing up behind the fence really like showed me, and coming to this country showed me how amazing it is to have all these opportunities and how diverse the culture is. And I think we tend to forget how culture can affect our uh, preferences. And also, I think we should be really careful with how we're using basic cell phone and, and the social media so we don't hurt each other, because we're becoming our own threats. So the next time any of you want to complain about surveillance, um, at least you do not live in a secret city that you can't leave. Well, now it's open. It's called um, Arzama 16, and the number was assigned to mislead US, of course, during Cold War. And now it's on the map. It's still closed. Uh, but you, I, I can't go because I have dual citizenship. But my mom, she usually leaves the city and comes and sees me. Um, you can check it out. It's uh, now, Right now it's called Sarov, or it used to be Arzama 16, and you can find it. You just can't get in to the city. <laughs> <laughs> Even I can't. Wow, okay, so I guess that brings us up to another similar point. Uh, when we think about privacy, you also think about you know, how that can affect things like free speech, or how you know, privacy can protect or promote speech. I know, Michelle, you might have some thoughts on this. Do you or anyone else have anything to add? Uh, no thoughts on this whatsoever. <laughs> no. Um, it's, so to me, privacy and freedom of expression are really go hand in hand. Um, when you are trying to talk about controversial topics, things explore subjects that you might be a little bit uncomfortable with, um, you need the ability to do it without fear of reprisal whether that's someone literally standing behind your shoulder, whether it's government surveillance, whether it's just you want to be able to speak in a forum um, online about a politician doing something that you don't approve of. Um, without the ability to do that anonymously, um, the discussion as a whole is just not as rich. And I think that's why when we talk about anonymity online, while it does have some negative consequences um, that people like to point out, and they are legitimate problems, um, such as people just being a lot more harsh uh, because they aren't speaking with their name attached to it. Um, overall, I think the benefit is good. It provides for a richer discussion um, on a wider array of topics. I definitely want to second that. I think um, Michelle is absolutely right. 
there's um, a really interesting book by Neil Richards, who's a professor at uh, Washington University School of Law called Intellectual Privacy that talks about how um, privacy enhances the ability to discourse speech and, and uh, sort of freedom from intrusion. Uh, the flip side of that, though, is that I think there have been some concerns, especially in the way of the Supreme Court decision in Sorrell versus IMS Health about the ability for privacy statutes to survive First Amendment scrutiny. I personally think that uh, some of these concerns are overblown, in part because the statute at issue in the case was a particularly badly written one um, in terms of free expression issues. We have sort of, especially I think post Snowden. Uh, there has been a little bit less uh, academic and policy attention to the issue of privacy, its intersection of with speech, and that some of the other issues that have come to light more recently have been perhaps more pressing. But I don't think the uh, story on that one has been finalized yet. I think we'll, we will um, see, especially if at the federal level there are uh, proposals for federal legislation that create new privacy protections, I think we will see more concerns about free speech, especially in an era where the courts have been very uh, inclined towards corporate speech. One of the things that we talked about earlier was whether or not data retention limitations, you know, they're beneficial. I could see a business claiming uh, data retention limitations as being constitutional under the First Amendment. I, I don't think that's a, I think that's an argument that some people wouldn't make. Um, whether or not it would gain traction, I think, is really up to debate, depending on the statute. But I think the questions of how privacy and speech intersect are still up in the air, especially as we think about race of reporting and how that intersects on the private sector and, and with the government. I also think there's a, there's a tie between uh, freedom of expression issues uh, and uh, both data transfer and uh, encryption. Um, so, for instance, as, uh, uh, as uh, you're undoubtedly aware, in, in Russia, they, uh, they instituted a law uh, it two years ago uh, uh, under which uh, data, personal information of, of Russian citizens, uh, wherever they are in the world, needs to be stored in Russia in, in open text, essentially in an unencrypted format, um, which uh, it, it, you know, the, uh, has an obvious effect on, on compliance issues for multinationals, and, and you may have seen the coverage about, uh, about the issues that Twitter had with that, but there's uh, a clear uh, freedom of expression issue there as well. <laughs> well, I mean, this is extraterritorial, though. I, I mean, one of the, you know, for all of the, for, for for all the reputational damage that the United States has suffered, at, you know, post Snowden, you know, and that, you know, uh, you know, for for intercepting communications and or allegations of that, it's astonishing the extent to which the countries who are making those allegations are, you know, have like these type of localization requirements. Uh, Russia's not alone. It is also worth noting that. When a lot of these regulations are put forward, um, the viewpoint, or at least what's said by the governments um, who are trying to push forward these laws, um, is that it's in the name of privacy. They want to be able to protect their citizens. Um, they want to be able to control the way people handle data. But at the same time, that opens it up for um, national security, for law enforcement agencies, and it leaves, uh, it leads to back doors, it leads to a variety of things that are not quite as palatable and are definitely not in the interest of uh, the privacy of, of uh, citizens there. Great, thank you. Uh, I think that we'd like to switch tracks a little bit right now. So the Internet Law and Policy Foundry is an organization that was created to help uh, kind of young, early stage professionals who are trying to get into technology law and policy. Just an organization to help people who are on their ways to careers um, like all of these panelists have. So I was wondering if um, all of you could just speak a little bit about how you got to where you are and what advice, if any, you have for students or early stage professionals in this space. Elena, do you want to start? Sure. 
pattern to privacy um, a mistake. <laughs> um, well, it wasn't a mistake, but it, it wasn't definitely planned, and privacy didn't exist at that time as it exists right now. Um, first, I just developed a passion for technology. I was uh, at Wilma Hale in Boston, and I was working with a lot of bright people all over the world coming to the United States, and um, I just some of them do nanotubes, someone C plus, and just was amazed how intelligent they were and what amazing things they're doing to, to, to the world, for the world. And so I was like, I want to do technology. This is something that it was 2000. So I was like, this is amazing. This is interesting. Technology was like coming out IP. And um, so I got into IP and I was doing IP and I was very interesting, interested in confidentiality aspect and due diligence. We purchased in a lot of different companies um, and uh, just that confidentiality and security aspect was very interesting to me. And uh, very slowly I moved from that piece to privacy. Uh, but again, I was hired by a bank to uh, work on a contract, like a literally two week contract. And I was thinking to myself, banks, boring, I'm not going there. And, um, and my recruiter was like, just go there. It's, it's fun and it's interesting. You wanted to explore the different industries, like why not? I was like, okay, so I, I was there for two weeks, and that's why I was like, never say no to things, especially if it's like two week assignment only. <laughs> so um, I, I actually didn't regret it. I was really interested, and in, uh, the whole concept of banking and financial industry was very new. I was learning a lot, and that's my biggest fear to stop growing. Um, I really enjoyed, and the people were fascinating. The woman who was my boss, she was, she is my friend, and she's my mentor, and. Um, so she said, can you stay for another week? I have some really cool privacy project. We're doing online banking and mobile banking, and uh, there are a lot of uh, issues with privacy and security. You'll work with tech teams, you love technology. Here it is, just whatever you wanna do, just stay. Um, I actually had another job offer at a law firm at that time, and she convinced me, she gave me whatever you want, just stay, and I stayed. I didn't wanna really be in financial industry at all. I really didn't care much about privacy at that time, but I was really interested in mobile and online banking as a product because it was a lot of technology working with security teams and IT, and that's it. So I got hooked. I, I couldn't believe it that uh, it was such a fascinating, amazing um, environment and uh, people and uh, diverse backgrounds and everyone brings something and you can make the difference. And that's it, the rest of the history. I am left financial industry, but... <laughs> I will second the accident question mark uh, career path. I, uh, before I went to law school, I, part of the motivating reasons for me to go to law school um, about a decade ago was uh, a lot of file sharing litigation that was happening. And there also was some privacy and security stuff, especially with the EFF suit um, and Hepdan versus at and So those were sort of the motivating factors. But people were talking much more about copyright than they were about privacy and speech and security. And, and my entering into this world was truly an accident. Um, it was really based on uh, getting a job at the ACLU that focused much more on privacy and civil liberties than it would on IP. And I was like, ACLU was great. I would definitely do that. And it worked out really well. Uh, for me, because it would allow me to build a resume that really focused on privacy and civil liberties work. In terms of um, advice, I, I think one of the worst words I've ever heard is the word networking. Uh, but the part of it that I think is valuable is talking to people as though they're human beings. Uh, for those people who are lawyers, and I think probably also for engineers, although I don't want to cast aspersions on a profession I'm not in, but at least for lawyers, um, no one in this room, but many lawyers are very weird people and don't really know how to talk to other people. And that's why if you are a person who happens to be a lawyer who can talk to other people, you probably will be in a very good situation because it means that you can talk to someone here or another event or through work um, or through some other random time when you meet a lawyer, which is probably very often, about um, what they do. and how they got into it and why it's interesting, what they're working on and what they've been really engaged with. And that part of networking, if that is a good part of it, is probably how I managed to build a career out of this work. Um, I think it's important to figure out what, not only what substantively you're interested in, what areas, but also how you want to work in those areas. Um, we're lucky now, I think, that technology law and policy is 
growing pretty rapidly, and people can have careers that are a lot more diverse than they used to be. You could be a compliance attorney, you could work in a nonprofit, you could work in house, you could work for the government, uh, you could work internationally, you can work on privacy, speed, security, international issues, intersections between those things. I mean, there's a lot more options, and taking the time to try to figure out what it is that's motivating you in, that, in this area, I think will probably make you a lot happier as a person, but probably a lot more successful in your career. So it sounds like the lesson of this panel is if you want to do privacy work, uh, start in IP. Um, <laughs> I too started uh, as, as a, an IP litigator. Uh, I did that for about four years. Um, before I went to law school, uh, I was a software developer. And um, I, so I had sort of a, a longstanding interest in technology um, and an interest in incorporating a technical uh, aspect uh, in, into my work as a lawyer. Um, so after uh, doing IP uh, litigation about four years, um, I, I moved to the FTC, um, and there uh, it's, it's been a mix of, of all kinds of stuff that the FTC does, including uh, uh, data security and, and, and privacy, but also uh, advertising uh, cases uh, and, and, as well, and, and competition work as well. Um, so um, uh, I think, you know, uh, have uh, a lucky accident um, is, is pretty good advice. Um, the other thing I'll say is, is just that I interned uh, for the FTC in law school, and so I think, and I think that was uh, pretty instrumental in having people uh, at, at the, the FTC uh, just sort of discard my resume uh, immediately. And so, you know, interning where uh, you want to work, interning with the sort of in the areas you want to work in, uh, if that's something that's possible, uh, student, for example, uh, is is a great idea. Um, and um, yeah, other than that, um, I think probably um, there's lots of ways in. Um, I certainly did privacy for a long time, and I'm doing it um, So uh, not something that, that sort of has to be a linear. So mine was not by accident. Um, more of an obsessive personality issue. It, I too started an IP, um, so I'm keeping with the trend here, but it's, I was asked uh, while I was at the foundation to write the next privacy policy for Wikipedia and its sister projects, and I took that on um, and really dove deep into it. Um, it led to me talking to all of the departments of uh, media, understanding what their privacy practices were, what their needs were, um, what the user community wanted and needed out of the privacy policy, and as a result of that process, I realized all of these things that we could do to help better secure our um, user and donor data. And so that turned into, you know, 30 more projects, and it became um, more of a career than I thought it was going to be originally. And if not, I realized that this was something that I was passionate about, so I wanted to continue to pursue. So part of my advice to you is if you're already at an organization um, that doesn't have a big privacy practice, look for ways that you can improve it. Um, start taking initiative and propose projects and see where that goes. Um, another thing you can do is, uh, similar to networking, the dreaded word networking, um, is join a professional organization that has to do with privacy. Um, I know Tiffany might laugh at me for doing this, but um, I was recently, I recently started with the International Association of Privacy Professionals, and they have certifications, they have good networking opportunities, um, and other ways to get involved in privacy issues. Well, let's see, you may be surprised to hear I'm an IP lawyer. Um, uh, and uh, I'm happy to share my background, how I ended up working in data privacy and data security, but I'm not sure it'd be germane to any of you, uh, it, because it wasn't a discipline when I first came out. Um, so I, I went to graduate school in computer science in the early 90s and worked in data mining, uh, which, was, uh, which was what big data was referred to uh, back then. And uh, immediately went to law school after that. And uh, uh, remember, I was asked in a in an internet policy class, well, first of its kind internet policy class in the mid 90s to, uh, to write a paper on the legal implications of data mining and found that I actually, there was no substantive material based on which I could write a paper. I mean, there was the Fair Credit Reporting Act and FERPA um, and <laughs> no body of law, the data directive was just coming out. Um, so, but uh, nonetheless, uh, 
you know, uh, the cryptography was becoming an issue. You know, I spent a lot of time in law school being uh, the person uh, who was explaining uh, asymmetric encryption keys and how that uh, how that concept works. Uh, and then um, uh, I came to Silicon Valley in the 90s to do tech deals and uh, gravitated into data privacy, data security as part of doing international da international deals, uh, uh, primarily because the, you know the data transfer laws were emerging in Europe, particularly under the data directive. And so uh, in doing multinational IT services agreements, we needed to have fairly robust clauses uh, to, uh, to, to, to address uh, issues under the EU data directive uh, and got into data security issues that way as well uh, in um, developing an understanding of, of, of data security standards so that we could build uh, contractual terms um, uh, consistent with them. Things have came to my mind. So one of the things I want to add, if you are thinking about doing another degree um, or going to law school, don't. <laughs> Just, I, I highly recommend that uh, if you have some time to explore the subject or expand your subject matter expertise, look into the identification of data and data analytics. This is the next thing. This is something that can help us mitigate risk. This is something that makes you so valuable to the business. And if you were a privacy and security head, oh my God, you're golden. So this is something I struggle because there are no, well, I enjoy it very much, but it's very difficult because the, it's very complex. And not every type of data is regulated, meaning you don't have very clear guidelines how you identify data. For example, HIPAA for healthcare does provide guidelines, but it's very hard to follow. And there are not so much material, so the experts they are the people who do that. And if you become one of those experts, you'll be all set. Um, plus it's fun, especially if you, if you love data. Another thing I wanted to mention is cloud. So a lot of products are moving to cloud. It's so important to understand how it works. If you're a privacy professional, take the cloud certification. It's very helpful. It's, uh, it's very handy. It, it's gonna help you a lot. Even if you don't do cloud right now, you will be. So knowing when you work with your businesses. So just for your own sake, just understand cloud and what's happening in this field. Great, thank you everyone. I think that's a lot of really interesting information for people trying to start out. So don't go to law school, but if you do go to law school, <laughs> but if you do do law, do IP law to, <laughs> to become a privacy professional. Um, but this is really helpful. I think really just, you know, Take chances, go for what you're interested in, join organizations, get certifications, make your own way. And I think that's something that we've all done and I think something that everyone can do really, no matter where you are in your career right now. So I'd like to thank everyone on this panel and open this up for questions. Uh, Jennifer has a microphone, so if anyone has a question, please raise your hand and she will come to you. If the light is green, it's on. Um, the, the button is on the bottom of the microphone. Perfect. Hello, uh, thank you for coming. Um, earlier you spoke to the shift in the expectation of private data. Um, the question that came to my mind is why are we still using social security numbers as a unique identifier? <laughs> so identity is a really difficult thing to do Context of technology, um, and you're right that SSNs were never designed to be like one of the main corroborating identifiers. Um, why are we still doing it? Uh, lack of will and the fact that it's a hard problem. I think um, you know there have been I, that's a little disingenuous. I, a lot of disingenuous. There have been people who are trying to address this problem, um, but this is one of the really thorny issues. I think everyone agrees. You know. With, as with many issues that we deal with, you know, from a policy point of view, everyone agrees it's, it's not working, but no one has really yet come up with a great solution that I know of. I mean, I think there probably is one, but I'm not that smart. Um, again, I mean, what's the motivating factor for change? I mean, probably some scandal, um, which we haven't yet seen to be big enough to really motivate it to the level that would lead to that kind of change, at least, you know, but we'll see. Uh, thank you for such an enlightening discussion. Uh, 
So as far as uh, destruction of extraneous data goes, uh, which companies hold, uh, there are a lot of times uh, technology progresses based on research on this so-called unrelated data, which uh, because of researchers doing their research on such uh, data, especially in the medical field, they come out with technological advances based on that. And they don't, at the outset, they don't know that it's going to be relevant to them. Uh, so how do you balance this with the privacy perspective, and where do you draw the line? Thank you. So a lot of statutes are, have expressed carve-outs for research and, uh, and, and for enabling uh, uh, collaboration. So for instance, if you look at both the uh, federal and state statutes uh, governing educational data for, uh, and the state-level analogs, they typically have carve-outs allowing data to be retained and shared so long as it's done for uh, educational purposes and uh, if it's, if it's de-identified. Uh, you know, I, I, in some sense, CISA uh, has has that characteristic too, right? Where the statute was passed last year uh, uh, to enable companies uh, to share information regarding security breaches or potential se uh, security glitches um, w uh, without exposure to third-party liability for doing so. And in some sense, that's also a carve out to to, to uh, uh, allow for research and. So I, I see that as a recognized issue. I think healthcare is probably where that is perhaps uh, uh, most significant. We have an exception for healthcare research. So. Yeah, I mean, outside of the, the research context, um, I think you know that that's a question that is going to vary significantly with the, the product or the business that uh, for which the data was collected. I mean, um, uh, I, I I believe, and somebody here will doubtless know better than me, but that um, Google retains uh, search history results uh, for a certain period of time, and then after that, I think it's retained for longer, but it's, uh, but it's anonymized. And then I think there is a roll-off where they're discarded, but I'm, I'm not sure about that. But I think that's sort of an indicator that Google has made a judgment, uh, and I'm speculating, uh, not speaking for the commissioner or any individual commissioner, um, but I'm making, it's, I think that's a, that reflects a judgment that uh, the, and the, that search history data is not particularly valuable in a, in a form which you know, where it's linked to a particular user after a certain period of time. And I think that sort of has a certain intuitive appeal. You know, so if I'm in the market for some product, I, I, it's only going to be true for a period of time, and then I'll presumably make a purchasing decision that you know, nobody really cares if I was in, in looking to buy a doghouse uh, four years ago. Um, so. I think that's the kind of analysis that you need to do thinking about how to retain data in order to improve it. And also to apply the case that there is not much more value. Great. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I wanted to ask about, then this is for anybody in the panel, um, but about the line between us today and a future where it's difficult, based on, based on what information is available about a citizen, a particular citizen, um, who they associate with and their conversations, where is the line um, between today and a future where it's really difficult for people to associate with one another and participate in uh, private communication? Um, and have we, what's the line for you and do you think we've crossed that line? And I think, I think being able to talk to one another and, and develop ideas together and opinions together is essential for democracy. So um, no, that's my question. It's a, it's a philosophical question. I think we're very close to crossing the line, in my opinion. And I think I go back to my comment about our code of conduct that we should uh, we, we, should, we should take responsibility in our own actions, not to blame companies and the government for what they do and what we expect them to do. We should take charge. We should voice our opinions. And, uh, and I think we're doing much better with that. But I think what we're not doing very well is respecting each other's privacies. And it's going to get worse. Uh, we talked about all wearable technologies, uh, medical devices. Uh, we haven't even addressed the self-driving cars. That's like another... <laughs> <laughs> animals, so I don't know if we want to go there, but um, 
We forget that technology gives us a lot of new opportunities. Think about those self-driving cars. They give opportunities to, uh, for a person who is handicapped to drive somewhere when they probably never had a chance to do so. Uh, for parents, they can send kids to school or somewhere else, well, if the car is safe, finally. Um, and uh, there are a lot of opportunities, but at the same time, even though the data is collected by auto manufacturers right now, your speed, your speeding, your accidents, and et cetera, the, the cars will probably collect data about when did you go to the liquor store? Uh, are you taking a sick day or are you just like drinking right now? Or let's say if you are going through litigation, divorce, like it, maybe we'll have records where you spend on your Saturday night and you still married legally. So, um, I, I think we, I, I don't know the answer to this question. I think just being aware and continue raising those good questions and talk to each other, talk to the government, talk to companies, having those panels, I think that's only one, one way, I mean, one thing we all can do. And I think taking responsibility, that's very important. But Is this better? Yeah, there we are. Um, it relates to what Michelle was saying before about privacy is promoting speech and, and um, anonymity and sort of the ability to play around with intellectual ideas. I mean, it, it sort of reminds me a little bit of secondhand smoke, where you know you may you might make your own individual choice about smoking, but you also affect other people. And I think that people are empowered to make their own individual choices about what they do with their data and how they what levels of privacy they have. But increasingly, that affects other people as well. Um, and that, I think, has yet to be determined what the bounds of that are without, you know, coming up against a lot of the other free expression rights that we value within, within this country and I think globally as well. Um, I don't think there, I think if any of us had an answer to this question, we'd probably be doing some, you know, have a lot of money and have a different job, but um, it's certainly a, a complicated issue. I do think that there is more of an awareness of it, which is better, um, not to be really Pollyanna-ish, but I do think that a better perspective, or at least more individuals understanding how these areas intersect, uh, certainly is more likely to lead to a more tenable solution. And I would also say that um, uh, the issue of uh, uh, of privacy in communications and personal communications and personal associations is is an, an, an attention between that and. Uh, and uh, you know, open disclosure is not new. I mean, so FOIA, right? It, 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 if you work for the government and, and, and you know, federal or state uh, under FOIA or its state analogs, there's a possibility that your, you know, your communications uh, over email, which may be entirely personal, are, will, will be available to someone who puts in a request. Right, and and that's not new. That, that this this predates concern over uh, over contemporary privacy issues. Um, I also think that uh, uh, so as pointed out, I'll, I'll, you know, we're going to be facing these issues in a much bigger way with the Internet of Things. I mean, with telematics, driverless cars, etc. It's it, it's difficult for us to conceive right now. Uh, what, how, how easily, what types of information are going to be tracked, how easily they're going to be tracked, and how readily they're going to be available. Um, uh, but I, I think there is some recognition in the law, a re, uh, sort of a retroactive recognition in the law, uh, that there should be protections for private communication. So, for instance, it generally takes a warrant um, to get access to communications on social media. Right? It, 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 it's not just... Uh, it, 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 even though these are communications which are you know, quasi-public, uh, the, 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 there is legal process and there are Fourth Amendment rights uh, in those communications and associations. Um, one other thing that's worth noting is, and we're already starting to see it a little bit more, is the concept of privacy as a product, as a feature, and something that you can market on. Um, Think about signals, think about quicker, um, think about other ways that you can send messages um, and have these communications be private. There's going to start, I mean, think about, uh, I guess, the way Apple is starting to um, really show exactly how committed they are to privacy. That's important to a lot of people. That could be the difference between whether they decide to get an iPhone or an Android phone. Um, so I think naturally there will be 
also like the rise of privacy products in conjunction with um, things that like are more privacy invasive. Uh, yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I think it's great for people to vote with uh, feet and vote with their wallets. Um, I mean, there's a sort of dynamic that happens where uh, technology is new, it's complicated, and it's difficult to execute the first time. Um, but after a while, uh, you see that that product um, becomes, uh, in sort of its, its primary features, becomes commodity. So you have search engines that don't store your search, search, your, your search history. Uh, you have messaging products that um, have uh, strong encryption. Um, and so I think folks who care about privacy uh, can, can both use those products, but they can also pay for them. Um, and it probably makes sense also to think if it's an open source product, for example, um, to do something to, to support the users of that product. Um, and, you know, that'd be great to get it to your friends if you have uh, conversations that are stored in which you can see. Um, <laughs> you can do that, but you have sort of have to uh, help the developers make that possible. Okay, and I think we might have time for maybe one more question. So, go ahead. All right, so um, speaking of democracy, what about political parties using big data, right? And the rise of, um, they're not doing it for money, but using big data and merging every bit of public data with whatever data they can acquire. Like every citizen has a profile. And right now there's no clear way to opt out. And I can only see that getting worse where lobby groups would actually say, hey, you know, how can we get tip the scales in our favor. So like, how can we protect our privacy in that sense? I mean, I know that the FEC is interested in this, but um, again, it, it intersects with other areas of the law, especially under the First Amendment, um, how political parties use data and, and what limitations there are. Um, I think that you would certainly see a lot of litigation about this issue if it were actually to be challenged by the FEC, sorry, that's the Federal Election Commission, um, or another agency. I think, um, you know, voter targeting is very vital to both of the major political parties. It's how they get turnout, it's how they get donations, it's how they, um, you know, figure out the likelihood of what races to put a lot of money into or what races to let slide. Um, so I think you're right to point out that it's an area of political concern. In terms of opting out, I don't think there are, you know, I don't know of obvious ways in which individuals can do so. I think a lot of this targeting does happen on the zip code level, and so it's not necessarily maybe about you individually, but it's about your demographics and where you're located, what kind of individual they think that you are based on that. Um, I think voters are going to be increasingly targeted and that's probably increasingly cranky about this kind of targeting, which probably will be the only ways in which uh, there might be any change. But I also even hesitate to say whether or not, given the current political climate, whether individual voter agitation has an effect on political parties, because I think any one who has a thesis about how individual voters relate to political parties is probably having their thesis uh, questioned a lot this year. So we'll have to see what happens. I think so. It's it's well known and parties acknowledge that they have individual voter uh, records and, and, and data analytics are how campaigns are done. And you'll notice that both at the federal level and at the state level, uh, the statute, the data privacy statutes generally include exceptions for political campaigns. So the TCPA, for instance, uh, does not apply to uh, political calls. Uh, you know, the shine the light law in California, there's an exception there for, uh, for, 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 for political solicitations or, or for sharing of political information. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, part of that might be because legislature, le legislators are interested in promoting democracy. <laughs> And it partly might be that they're writing the laws that govern themselves. I wanted to share a case study. Um, I was at the Privacy Con in DC recently. And uh, so if you've never been to Privacy Con, it's pretty cool. It's a conference that opened to public and uh, different researchers all over the world come and present their studies. And there are like, different open source software and there are research and development projects. So 
It wasn't part of the presentation, but uh, I talked to a couple of researchers, uh, some of them are for Europe, some of them are for Princeton, and they shared that they were talking exactly what you're concerned with. And they said, well, you can't really do anything about it because the data is collected all over the place, on the internet and, uh, and maybe beyond. So what you can do, and they done some studies, and it really affected people's privacy. So use fake names where you can. Um, Lyft, Uber, don't use your name. Like sure, the credit card will be there with your name, but use your fake name. Um, create something. Coffee, use a different name. Um, use cash. Don't shop online. So sure, it's going to affect your convenience. But they've done some studies, and it showed that it did change slightly um, the type of information. At least you can stop following uh, people online uh, the moment you go on Amazon and check some vitamins. Those vitamins will follow you for the rest of your life. <laughs> it doesn't matter where you go. <laughs> but uh, so they've done some basic changes, like using their names in public, um, and with some apps like Uber and Lyft and uh, shopping activities online. Um, so and they noticed the difference. Well, it's going to take probably some time. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, everyone. I think that's about it for our time. But um, on behalf of the Wikimedia Foundation and the Internet Law and Policy Foundry, I'd like to thank all the panelists, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming out to our event. Um, so now it's time for more free wine and cheese. But thank you again to everyone, to all of you, for coming to our event and for helping us.